Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Bible study. Pardon us for being just a few minutes late, but we are glad you're here and ready to dive into the Gospel of John. At the end of the broadcast, we'll have a little fellowship together, and I'll say hello to some of you and uh, see who's there. Uh, would love to see your name in town and uh, say hi at the end of the broadcast. But for now, let's have a word of prayer and let's get into our Bible study. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that we're able to come tonight into the Gospel of John. And as we come into the upper room and see the Last Supper and the uh, washing of the feet, dear Heavenly Father, we pray that it would elicit in us a not only a uh, desire to share the love that Jesus Christ had for the world, but a desire to be a servant, as Jesus even was such a servant, as we see in this washing of the feet. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And to see Jesus loving the world and to see him showing that in the service that he gives in washing the disciples' feet. That's what we look at tonight as we come over and uh, look into the Gospel of John as we have been looking here uh, now for 52. This is the 52nd Happy New Year session. The 52nd session of the Gospel of John, and uh, we're taking it verse by verse, sometimes word by word, and uh, growing and enjoying it every step along the way. You have an outline that's available for you, and you can take that and either uh, follow it uh, as we go or look into it later. But let's come into today the 13th chapter of John. As always, we've got the King James Bible right here. We'll use that mostly. We've got some Greek we might look at, and we've got some Young's Literal we might look at. Uh, as we pick up in uh, chapter 13, verse 1, and it says, now before the feast of the Passover. A couple of things I want to say here. One is the word now. The word now is this Greek word right here, de. And de is not a word that means right now, this moment. So, you don't have to tie it immediately with chapter 12. De is a word oftentimes uh, translated but, uh, but it's a transition word. It's a later word. It's something is different when you have de. So, now, moving on, now, before the feast of the Passover. Now, I think that issue of being before the feast of the Passover uh, does tell us, let's see if I can get that just the right size for you. Yeah, we'll go with where it was. Uh, before the feast of the Passover tells us it's not the feast of the Passover. And yet we are in the upper room and we are having the last supper, which must mean that the last supper is not the feast of the Passover. That is going to explain a couple of things. One, it's going to explain why later in the passage, we won't get that far tonight, but it's going to explain why later in the passage, uh, they're using bread and it's the word for unleavened bread. It's okay, it doesn't start till the next day, the feast of the unleavened bread. And so the feast of the Passover hasn't started. It also tells us that this was not a Passover Seder. This was something else. Every now and then, I'll have our friends, uh, say, from Friends of Israel or one of the other uh, ministries, they'll call and say, hey, we've got a speaker in the area. Would you like uh, to have them come speak at your church? And I say, yeah, I would be happy to have them come speak to our church. And uh, they often travel in the spring. And so they say something like, oh, well, he can talk about Christ in the Passover. And I say, he shouldn't talk about Christ in the Passover at our church because I teach that uh, Christ didn't make it to the Passover. Christ was the Passover lamb. Christ didn't have the last supper. And they said, well, yeah, he can talk about the Holocaust too. And I said, that would be wonderful. Let's have him talk about the Holocaust. So most everyone says it's the Feast of the Passover. I disagree. I think it was before the Feast of the Passover. I don't know where I got such a crazy idea, but I'll just go with the text as it says, literally, before the Feast of the Passover here on this night of the Last Supper, when Jesus knew that his hour was come. Now, let's take that uh, phrase right here. Jesus knew that his hour was come. How did he know it? Uh... I don't know. The father told him, I suppose. How long had he known it? 
I don't know that either. I know that many times he said, my hour is not yet come. And so was he limited to that information that it just isn't now? Or did he know when the hour was? And so knowing when the hour was, obviously you can say that uh, the hour is not come. But now, however he knew it and however long he had known it, Jesus knew that his hour was to come. Now, I suppose that if we were just to, uh, you know, plop ourselves down in the average Bible study and we were to say, what is the hour of Jesus? When Jesus said, my hour is not yet come or my hour is come, what is that hour? I suppose that the average student of the word would say, well, that was the hour of his crucifixion. And I probably would have said that too. Before looking closely at the scripture, notice what it says. He knew that his hour was come that during this hour, he should depart out of this world unto the father. Having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them into the end. Now, it was the hour, his hour, that he should depart out of the world. I would have said, and I think most people would have, would have said, again, the hour is the crucifixion. The hour is the death of Jesus Christ. But here, it goes farther than that. It's not only the death, burial, and resurrection, but even the ascension of Jesus when he should depart out of this world. And that tells us, by putting that all in the same hour, so to speak, and even the death of Jesus didn't take place in a literal hour, so we take this in the sense of uh, the, the time period, And, uh, you know, that's uh, well attested down through the scriptures and even in our own language. So because the death of Jesus wasn't in a single hour, and certainly the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus was not in a single hour, it helps us to see that the scriptural point of view is all of those are a package. You can't have the death of Jesus without the burial of Jesus. You can't have the death and burial of Jesus without the resurrection of Jesus. You can't have the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus without the ascension of Jesus. It all is one package. That is his hour that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Now, he's going to go to the Father, where he is today, of course. He goes to the Father. He sits at the right hand of the Father, and he waits until the hour in which... He shall make his enemies a footstool for his feet. There is another hour yet to come. But all of this, I think, says that we don't fully understand the life and ministry of Jesus if we don't see him sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting for his coming kingdom. So his hour should come that he should depart from the world unto the Father. Having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Now, I suppose this participle right here, having loved, uh, speaks of all of the ministry that uh, builds up to this. But certainly what he has done is he has loved his own, which were in the world. Now, who who are his own? You could say his own were the 12 apostles. It would be okay. You could say his own were his followers, the disciples. Letting scripture interpret scripture, if we take his own, I think that the most natural is we get to John chapter 1, verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But even though they did not receive him, he loved his own. And certainly he did that. His love for Israel uh, was uh, his love for the Jewish people, his love for his own nation was beyond compare, having loved his own. Now, we also know that since he loved his own, now we have the love of the Father and the love of the Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And the Son loved the world and loved them what? Loved them unto the end. Now, I happen to think that is not unto the end of his earthly ministry, though that would be true. Uh, You know, some of the last words he's going to speak are, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, how I long to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not let me. And so he weeps over Jerusalem. He loved them all the way to the end, even on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He loved them to the end of his ministry. Then he, at the very end, he says to his apostles, 
uh, go first to Jerusalem and be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea to Samaria, to the remotest part of the earth. He loved them to the very last moment on earth. But I think that to the end here, the word is telos. And telos is a word that means, you know, coming, coming to the end. We talk about a telescope. It's uh, looking to the ends. Uh, looking as far as you can go. I think that I really would take this more than to the end chronologically, uh, but I would say, which he did, love them to the end chronologically, that he loved them to the farthest degree that could be loved. This is how Jesus loved his own. The Father loved the world. Jesus loved his own. And now we see him in the Last Supper, and the author of the Gospel of John is giving us a little bit of detail about uh, the setting that we've got in this Last Supper. Now, verse 2, supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Let's stop right there and, again, take these kind of phrase by phrase and then put them together. Supper being ended. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds to me like supper is finished like they have already eaten, and yet he's about to wash their feet. Doesn't make sense that you do the washing after supper instead of before supper. I think that uh, uh, our understanding is before supper, Jesus uh, um, washed their feet. And furthermore, it's later in the chapter, he's going to talk about the, the bread and the dipping of the bread, now, why then does it say supper being ended? When you, uh, when you uh, look at this supper, again, it's the last supper. It is the supper that is spoken of in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It is the supper that, again, is uh, not only a, not, not a Passover meal, but it was, again, before the Passover. And this supper, is it ended? Well, let's take a look at the Greek uh, here. If we go down to uh, verse 2 in the Greek, uh, genom, genomenu, genomenu, taking place, taking place, and supper taking place. Uh, let's look in the Young's literal and supper being come. Hmm. Is supper ended? Is supper taking place? Or is supper being come? Uh, you know, I didn't uh, look. Let's look at the uh, New King James uh, right here. I haven't uh, checked this out. Um, New King James does say ended. Uh, let's go ahead, however, and look at, uh, let's say, New American Standard. And it says during supper. Um, so are we having supper? Is supper over? Is it during supper? What's going on here? Uh you know, uh, let's just check one more. Let's go ahead and check the uh, ESV and see what they've got to say about this. They say during supper also. So King James, New King James, supper being ended. It actually is not an issue of underlying text. It is an issue of uh, what do we do with this uh, particular word? Uh, the word genomai, let's uh, look at it uh, here. And the particular word genomai, I'm not sure if you can see the small print here, but genomai is to become, to become. Now, supper becoming. It is uh, an aorist, that is a point in time, uh, participle happening at a certain point in time. So supper becoming, supper uh, uh, where's, where's the, uh, how do they have it over here again? Uh, uh, supper taking place, supper being come. That's the literal translation. How is that supper ended? Genomai really does mean to come into existence. Now, I think you can take this supper came into existence Supper having come into existence, that is, it's supper time. They rang the bell, supper time, and the devil. Now, we could look at that and we could say, okay, uh, whatever, before supper, after supper, during supper, whatever, it happened that night. And not that big a deal. The only thing that is that big a deal is that you and I need to know when we pick up a Bible that we've actually got one. 
And do we have a Bible that has errors like here? Hey, it's not ended. Certainly not ended. They're, they're going to eat further later. Even if they've already eaten the appetizers here, it's a strange time to stop and wash your feet. But even if they've already eaten something here, they are going to eat something more. So supper's not ended. So should we look at it and say, ah, that was crazy King James, blah, 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 and you know, all that, and uh, put it aside? Or should we say we have an error there? Or what should we do? Now, I went back through the... Uh, translations that were the English translations that were in existence in the uh, in the days of the King James. You may remember that the King James was was instructed rule number 1 of their instruction is if there's nothing wrong with the way the bishop's bible has it go with the bishop's bible. Now, the instruction, that's not a bad instruction, by the way. The instruction was, hey, if the bishop's Bible has it wrong, if there's a better way to put it, if it needs to be changed, let's do it. But let's not just change for change's sake. And people read the bishop's Bible. They love the bishop's Bible. Let's go with the bishop's Bible. The bishops are reading that, after all. Uh, so there's that. Uh, I looked into the bishop's Bible, and guess what? It said, supper being ended. But... I decided to go ahead and look at some of the other Bibles of that day. Uh, I looked at, um, uh, let's see, the Geneva Bible. Uh, the Geneva Bible came a little bit afterwards. The Geneva Bible was not at all based upon King James or based upon the Bishop's Bible. And guess what? The Geneva Bible, that's the Calvinist Bible. The Geneva Bible said, supper being ended. Now, the word means supper coming into existence. And they said being ended. William Tyndale, of course, the famous translator, he said, supper being ended. All of the translations of that day, with the exception of Wycliffe. Wycliffe used a, a word that probably became our English word made. It, it was it's spelled M-A-A-D. Uh, supper was made is what, what, what he said again in a, in a much older English. He wrote in the 1300s. Uh, so Wycliffe was the only one from, say, the, the, uh, all of the early English translations from the 1300s to the uh, 1600s. He was the only one that didn't go with ended. All of them went with ended. Were they all wrong? Well, you know, as I looked it up, um, there's an interesting thing in the Oxford English Dictionary that says that the word ended means to perform duties, especially religious duties. Now, says it's obsolete, and I suppose that the reason they went with ended is not because they misunderstood the word genomai, which means to come, the reason they use ended is because there was a meaning that everybody in their day would have understand, and we have uh, forgotten that meaning today. Now, I, I uh, do that just to say, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, first of all, there is a, um, a cr an undue criticism of the King James Version, and they say, you know, it's just not very accurate, and they'll come to examples like this. I think that those who claim that the King James Version is not very accurate only Googled it. They didn't actually do the research. So they come and they do these things. Now, there's another thing that uh, I, I, I don't have a problem with the accuracy. I don't attack the King James uh, Bible. Uh, but uh, why do I go ahead and study these things? I happen to be a lover of words. And... It's curious to me that everyone in the 1600s and 1500s and 1400s and 1300s, they are talking about something coming to be and they're using the word ended. That tells me we've got a language, of course, that does change over time. I think that uh, what we have here is that that would have been very accurate. Not accurate in our understanding because we would think of supper being over. Supper is uh, the supper hour has come. The table has been set. That's what we've got. The devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So now we know the spiritual scene is we're there. That the devil 
put something into the heart of Judas. In a sense, I'll say the devil was now inhabiting Judas. At least he was inhabiting his heart. And as the devil is inhabiting his heart, he decides, hey, I'm going to betray him. I don't know when, this is something that took place before supper, when it actually happened. Of course, we know that he had already been to the priest. He'd got the 30 uh, pieces of silver, all those kind of things. Uh, and one of the things that's interesting to me here is that clearly Judas is Simon's son. Now, that tells me he is Judas is not the devil incarnate. Judas was born of a man named Simon. Judas grew up and they went down walking through the town and, uh, you know, they would see the boy up there and say, hey, that's Simon's son. That's Judas. He's, I mean, he's a, he's a guy. He's a real person, flesh and blood. But the devil inhabits him. Now, the reason that's interesting to me is because just last Sunday, we were talking about the Antichrist in our Second Thessalonians study and talk about how the Antichrist is currently being restrained. And we talked about who the restrainer is and all those kind of things. And if the Antichrist is currently being restrained, that must mean there is an Antichrist today. Otherwise, uh, you don't restrain that which doesn't exist, right? So the Antichrist is restrained. Now, my proposal was that he is restrained in the prison, in the abyss, and that at a time the abyss will be opened up and uh, he will be let loose. Now, uh, the thing is that uh, Second Peter talks about the spirits in prison, is the body of the Antichrist in prison now? Probably not. Rather, the spirit of the Antichrist is being withheld in prison. And someday the spirit is going to come up and the spirit probably is going to do exactly as he has done here. And he is going to uh, come in and uh, inhabit someone, maybe even a resurrected Judas. I don't know, uh, with a head wound, all that kind of stuff, remember. But... Uh, he is uh, going to, um, to, to, to be released and the spirit inhabit, put into the heart of a future Antichrist. Judas is a type of Antichrist, certainly. Now, this again is the spiritual uh, uh, occasion that we're at here. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things in his hands. There's several times already, two at least in the Gospel of John, John chapter 3 and chapter 5, I believe. Uh, uh, yeah, chapter 3, 35 and chapter 5, verse 22. Later on in chapter 17, verse 20, uh, verse 2, 17, verse 2, uh, John is going to say something similar as the Father has given all things into his hands. Not the exact words, but uh, very much saying the same things. The Father has given all things into his hands. Now, we remember Jesus, of course, saying, all authority has been given unto me on heaven and earth. Now, all authority has been given unto me. Sometimes we take that in Matthew chapter 28 and we, we assume that he received all authority after his resurrection. But that can't be true because right here before his resurrection, the Father had given all things unto his hands. And as a matter of fact, if we go to uh, the uh, first of these examples, John uh, chapter 3 verse 35, it says this is much earlier the uh, chapter three is the um, uh, changing water into wine, isn't it? Is it? No, uh, chapter two is that. But this is early on in the ministry. The father loveth the son and hath given all things into his hand. There it is early in the ministry. So Jesus already has all things. He has all things in his hand. And so we come again to verse three. The father had given all things into his hand. You know what amazes me about this? Uh, the father had given all things into his hands. This adds strength, I think, or adds impact to the words that are going to come in the Garden of Gethsemane later the same night. When Jesus says, is there any way this cup can pass me by? Truth is, there is. As the book of Matthew says, he could have called 12 legions of angels and been rescued. 
And he could have. He did not have to go to the cross. He had to go to the cross to be obedient to the Father. But he had the will to reject the cross. And he said, not my will, but thine be done. Even though I have all authority, all things have been given into my hands. I am going to go ahead and go to the cross. That, indeed, is to love them to the end, isn't it? So all things have been given into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God. Now, I think there's two reasons that this is uh, emphasized right here in verse 3, that uh, the Father had given all things, and he came from God and went to God. Uh, The reason that the writer puts this, and these are comments of the writer, the reason that the writer puts this is twofold. Uh, One of uh, these uh, reasons that uh, is given is because that is the purpose of the Gospel of John, that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the emphasis on the deity of Jesus Christ. And so every opportunity he gets it, John chapter 3, John chapter 5, John chapter 13, John chapter 17, and so many other places, he's going to give words and displays that All things had been given into his hands. He was come from God and went to God. It's another way of saying the main thing about the Gospel of John is these have been written in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and believing you might have life in his name. That's one reason he says it. Another reason he says it right here is because it makes such a contrast with with what is about to come. When Jesus very humbly washes the feet of his disciples, disciples, that doesn't look like verse 3. What we're expecting in verse 3 is Jesus to take the throne. Jesus to say, hey, all things have been given unto me. You all bow down and kiss my feet. That's, I mean, that's more what we're expecting, right? Say it bluntly. And yet he humbles himself and washes their feet. So, Uh, The two reasons that that is given there. Now, he riseth from supper. This one's kind of interesting. uh, uh, You know, did supper start? Didn't start? What's up with this? He rises from, notice it says the supper. Uh, And here we have the definite article that is given here. I think we could even say he riseth from the supper table. So we know that supper was come. The table had been set. Maybe even the food had been brought out. I don't know. And before they eat, he rises up. He rises from the supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. Obviously, uh, humbling himself. Obviously, this is not a situation of uh, pride. He's showing himself to be a servant. Rather than the royal robes, he took a towel and girded himself. And uh, we begin here to see uh, Jesus in the upper room as uh, he uh, washes the apostles' feet, the disciples' feet. Um, And I think it's interesting that uh, in the other passages of Scripture, by the way, it says his disciples were there. doesn't ever use the word apostles. There There were 12. We always, I mean, Michelangelo, he painted the picture of who was there. It was Michelangelo, wasn't it? Uh, the Last Supper. And uh, we always just picture Jesus and the 12 that uh, are there. But the words that are used are disciples. I think there were probably some others in the room as well. But he rises from supper, lay aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. That, of course, has become uh, such a famous scene within uh, Christianity and I suppose other out, even outside of Christianity. Uh, you can find uh, pictures of it. 
statuary of it, artwork of it, depictions of it, stories of it, drama of it, everything. This is in all four Gospels, such a key aspect of his ministry when Jesus humbles himself and uh, takes this towel, girds himself, pours water into a basin and begins to wash his disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel wherewith uh, he was girded. Verse 6, then cometh he to Simon Peter. So he's been working his way around to come to Simon, Simon Peter. Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Now, read this correctly, and the Greek helps us uh, just a little bit here. Uh, let me show you in the Greek. Uh, he comes, therefore, to Simon Peter and says to him, uh, uh, Lord, thou of me dost wash the feet. Now, I'm going to change this just slightly. You, my feet wash. I talked about this in uh, one of the presentations on Sunday that in uh, in the Greek language, you can mix up the, the words and still have meaning of them, pull them out of a hat and have meaning of it because the spelling of the word tells us whether it's a subject or uh, a, a, a genitive here, a possessive. So uh, in English, again, we have it do you wash my feet? Dost thou wash my feet? That's, there's a number of ways we can take this. In Greek, the emphasis is very clear. You are washing my feet? Go back to when uh, Jesus was baptized and comes into the Jordan River, and uh, you remember that uh, John the Baptist says, you know, I have need to be baptized of thee. And that's what's happening here is Peter is saying, I should be bowing down. I should be the one with the towel girded around my waist and I should be the one washing your feet. Lord, dost thou wash my feet? So the emphasis is on thou and my. Uh, and, uh, and, and the contrast between that. And what, can I put it this way? What is messed up about that? That's the wrong way around. And this is what Peter's saying. So Peter comes uh, very humbly uh, and uh, he says, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, what I do thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. Now, again, that's kind of similar to the baptismal experience, isn't it? Uh, you know, I, I have need to be baptized of you. Hey, to fulfill all righteousness, we're doing this. Don't worry about it. To fulfill all righteousness, we're doing it. So he says a similar thing to Peter. You don't, you don't know now, but you will know. You'll know what this is all about. You can kind of tell here, obviously, he's saying to Peter, hey, Peter, go along with it for a little bit. I understand that I'm the master. I understand that I'm the Lord. Go along with this a little bit. You're going to understand later. Uh, now, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit uh, down to verse 12, because thou shalt know hereafter. Well, of course, inquiring minds want to know, and he says you're going to know right now. And uh, this now here is the time word, unlike the, the beginning in, chapter, in verse 1. Right now, you don't understand what's going on. You don't know why this is going on, but you will know. There's a lesson here is what it says. And if we jump down to verse 12, we actually get the lesson. We don't have to wait very long. And I'm going to go down there and then we'll go back up and, uh, and we'll come back to a few things on this. But I want to uh, hit this uh, matter. So right now you don't know, but you're going to know. Now we're done with it in verse 12. After he had washed their feet and taken his garments, he was set down again and said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Remember, Peter, I said a moment ago, right now you don't know, but you will know. Do you know what I have done to me? And then he says in verse 13, ye call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. Now, catch that. He's not saying, hey, I'm trying to teach you that I am not the master. I am not the Lord. I'm just a regular man like him. That's what a lot of... Uh, uh, skeptics say, oh, Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus, uh, Jesus, everyone else claimed him to be God, but Jesus didn't. Jesus was just so humble and pure, and uh, he even washed their feet. And as he was washing their feet, he says, ye say well, 
That's a good thing to say. Master and Lord. We'll come back to a little more on that. Verse uh, 14 then. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Peter, now do you get it? Peter, I want you to know that I'm showing you how to lead. I'm showing you how to be a servant in the gospel of the kingdom. I'm showing you that as you're going out, you're going to have to love to the end. And it might even mean putting on a towel, kneeling down, and washing others' feet. Go for it. If I can do it, you can do it. So he's giving them, again, this example. And that was the meaning. It's the full meaning of the washing of feet. Now, let's back up to verse 7 again. Uh, so you'll know verse uh, hereafter. So back up to verse 8. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. <laughs> Peter might not have always been the best listener in the class. Uh, I had a lot of good things for him. Listening wasn't one of them. Uh, hey, Peter, I'm showing you something. Well, you're not going to show me anything. Ha, ha, ha. They, we do not do it this way, master. <laughs> Peter said, thou shalt never wash my feet. Now, again, we'll be hard on Peter, but wouldn't you agree that is a very humble position of Peter? Peter is saying, Always and forever you will be Lord and Master, not servant. And though, again, we're harsh on Peter and we make fun of Peter and all those kind of things, what a tremendous attitude in saying, I'll wash your feet. You know, example or not, teach me some other way. I will wash your feet. This is the way it should be. And, and Peter really was so insisting on that humility, and we ought to appreciate that. But look what happens next. Jesus answered him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Now, what is he saying, and what is, uh, how's Peter taking this? If I wash thee not, wash your feet, right here. Peter, you don't want me to wash your feet. I'm trying to give you an example. You don't know this, but I'm trying to give you an example. But if I, right here, don't wash your feet, sorry, Peter, you have no part of me. I think Peter understood this as saying, Peter, the kingdom will not be yours. Isn't that interesting? God had uh, given to him the keys of the kingdom, and yet right here he says, you'll have no part of me. The word part, by the way, is meros. It's the word that's often used for borders and coastlines. Uh, you, you don't get in the borders. You, the kingdom is not going to be yours. Remember, they're expecting Jesus to set up the kingdom. And James and John, of course, uh, you remember the question, you know, can one sit on your right and one sit on your left when the kingdom comes? Everything about these days is kingdom oriented. And this is still to this day what they are expecting is that soon Jesus in Jerusalem is going to establish his kingdom. He's going to overthrow the Romans. Uh, the, uh, the messianic kingdom is going to be established. So when Jesus said, thou hast no part with me, I think he's got to be taking that in a kingdom manner. Peter? You're not going to have a part in the kingdom. Now, the, the kingdom was so central to and is so central to Jewish belief that to be marked out of the kingdom was to go to hell. And so Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. I don't understand what's going on here, but I am committed to the kingdom. And it seems like I am the one that ought to be down there washing feet in, uh, in humble servitude, but I'm going with it. I wash my hands, my head, my feet. Jesus saith unto them, he that is washed needeth not to not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. Now, in verse 10, I think that what we have is 
Jesus is using an illustration that shouldn't be taken beyond the illustration itself. Uh, the illustration is what we today probably would call servant leadership. The illustration is Jesus, the master and Lord, was willing to humble himself. Peter, you should be too. That's the illustration. And so he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet. That is to say, you know, a friend uh, comes over to your home, you're having a party that evening, uh, they, they get all cleaned up and all fixed up, uh, and uh, they're ready for the party. They don't need to come in and shower at your house or bathe at your house. But in the Middle Eastern world, uh, walking in uh, and uh, walking along the dust in the sandals and all, uh, it, it, it became a common courtesy, especially at a social event. Oh, welcome. Let me call the servant in to wash your feet. And, uh, or let me wash your feet, whatever the case may be. Uh, and so that, that's, that's the illustration of the context here. What I don't want you to do, and I think would be dangerous to do, is to get in here, you know, he that is washed, you know, only needs to wash his feet and talk about, you know, being, uh, justified. If you're justified, then you only need to wash your feet. If you're saved, you're clean every whit except for your feet. And uh, that is to say, oh, you know, be careful little feet where you go. You know, you could, you could come up with some weird stuff here. I think Jesus uh, is using the illustration at hand, and it only illustrates that which is at hand, and uh, talks about, hey, here they come. But, but something just interesting here, uh, interesting to me anyway, because I like culture. The it seems that it was a culturally expected thing to wash feet. And the washing of feet is something that would have been, uh, again, culturally accepted and maybe even culturally expected. We see, you know, when... Uh, uh, Jesus' feet are washed by the pure nard and the tears and the hair and all that. That's sort of odd, oddly weird to us, isn't it? Now, even here, the washing of the feet is oddly weird to us. I don't think it was oddly weird to them. I think that was part of their culture. Now, another thing about that, that does tell us, just a reminder, this really is a very advanced culture. This is a clean culture. It is a culture, and, and the Jews, even to this day, tend to be a very clean people. When you go to uh, the Middle East, uh, you can, uh, in, in Jerusalem, in Israel anyway, you can clearly see the Arab towns versus uh, the Jewish towns. Uh, they have a very clean culture. And uh, that's true with certain cultures around the world. So here's a very clean culture. You know, you get in, hey, we, you got, we got to wash your feet here. You are so clean and nice, uh, but uh, you walked in the dust. Let's get your feet clean. Um, now, so he's clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. That little phrase right there, that is uh, uh, incognito speak, isn't it? Ye are clean, but not all. Does that mean you all are clean except your feet? I think he said it in such a way, probably in the illustration, that... If you're not thinking about it, he's saying, oh, you're, you're clean every whit, except for your feet. You need to wash your feet. Yeah, this is, a, this is what we do as Jews. We get our feet washed. We're clean, but we get our feet washed. And some people would not think deeply enough and see it. But Jesus, when he says you are clean, but not all, he could also mean you are clean, except, except one guy. Not all of you are clean. What's he saying there? He leaves it a little bit as a mystery. But the author comes and says, later with 2020 hide and sight, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. He's speaking of uh, Judas here, of course. And uh, that's, uh, you know, one of those things that, uh, takes some interpretation. This is the simplest manner of the rule of let scripture interpret scripture. You are clean, but not all. Hmm. What does that mean? That means they, 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 they took a bath before they got there and they're all clean except for their ankles and their feet. Is that what it means? 
The words could mean that. The grammar could mean that. Let scripture interpret scripture, and you begin to search for the scripture for an interpretation. And in this case, you don't have to search very far. The scripture interprets the scripture, and it tells us that he's speaking of Judas right here. Uh, he knew who should betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So back to verse 12, after he had washed their feet and taken his garments, he was set down again and he said to them, know ye not what I have done to you. Again, uh, uh, verses we've looked at. You call me master and Lord. You say, well, for so I am. I want to I want to uh, come back to these words right here. You call me master and Lord. Now, I didn't. Uh, I didn't verify this, but I assume that it is right. Uh, Bullinger says that there is never a place in the uh, Gospels, or uh, for this matter, uh, even in the uh, Epistles, where one of the apostles of Jesus speaks to Jesus or about Jesus and only says, Jesus. They always put a dignitary title on it. Lord Jesus. Master Jesus. Now, again, that's, that's Bullinger's contention. I presume that he is right on there. And here Jesus comes and seems to confirm that. You call me Master and Lord. Good job. That's what you should. You know, I, I think that obviously there are some secondary applications we can get from the story. I think that one of those is... Our speech ought to have respect for the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe even, I, I don't do this all the time, and uh, please don't hold me to it and chastise me because it uh, takes a 55-year-old tongue a long time to get retrained. I know this from uh, uh, having to um, quit all my uh, kingdom talk. Uh, but I think that we ought to kind of train ourselves into when we talk about Jesus, let's make sure we do it in a very respectful way. And to talk about our Lord Jesus Christ, our Master Jesus. Uh, and, to, and, you know, Jesus says, you say, well, this, this, is, this is right. This is a, a, a good, good, uh, good thing here. Uh, that's, that's the kind of uh, uh, speech you ought to have. I am that. And it is unfortunate, isn't it, that our society doesn't always speak of Jesus with a respectful manner. And they don't speak well when they do that. Uh, you call me Master and Lord, you say, well, so am I. If I then, being your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you, ought, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Now, this example that Jesus gives, he literally took off his garments, put on a towel, kneeled down, washed their feet. Was he requiring them to do that in a literal sense? I think here that he's saying this is an example Uh and uh, as, uh, as the example that is uh, given here, uh, yeah, want, let's pull up this uh, word here. Um, and uh, it is uh, hypodegma. Um, it, it's, it's a showing to, to make this uh, particular uh, display. Interesting that he doesn't use the word tupas. I've given you a, a tupas, a type, an example. I don't think that Jesus was saying you ought to literally take a towel, kneel down, wash feet. I think that he's saying that, verse 16, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he who sent greater than he who uh, sent him. What he's saying is, this is the kind of leadership I want you to display. As you go out into the world, when I go to the Father, I am now teaching you how to do it. This is the kind of demeanor I expect of you. Now, 
I suppose you could, and certain uh, groups in Christianity have interpreted this as an ordinance, so to speak, that uh, they they have to literally go and have uh, foot washing ceremonies. Uh, those who do foot washing ceremonies and believe in a foot washing ordinance have to believe that Jesus, when he said, I've given you this an example that you should do, you ought also to wash one another's feet. They, they obviously have to take that as literal. Now, of course, if the plain sense makes common sense, seek no other sense. And the plainest sense is take a towel, wash others' feet. That is the plainest sense of it. And yet, through it all, even in what Jesus says is, hey, you don't know what this is about, but you will later, that kind of shouts out to me, this is not about getting your feet washed, Peter. This is something different. I'm showing you an example. So I don't think that it it literally says you should wash one another's feet. Now, again, uh, in or if you have a foot washing ordinance, then you take that as he means literally wash feet. Now, n- no doubt about it. Those who do that would say you literally wash feet as a reminder to uh, to be the servant, just like your master and Lord was a servant. And uh, so there's certainly a symbolic aspect, even in literally washing feet. But does it literally mean wash feet? If you take it as an ordinance, you have to literally wash feet. And I think you have to say Jesus was speaking literally here. Uh, I also think that if you do it today and you're part of uh, one of the brethren groups or others that uh, wash one another's feet uh, as an ordinance, and you do that today, then you have to say that... Christians today ought to uh, take the example and instruction that Jesus gives to the disciples and take that as direct application for Christians today. So here he he did tell his disciples, and I'm going to broaden that beyond the 12. He did take his disciples and say, Ye disciples should do as I have done to you. Now, that's a direct command to the disciples. If you believe in an ordinance today, then you're saying it's a direct command to us. Now, I happen to reject both of those. I don't believe that uh, foot washing is an ordinance. I don't think that Jesus was speaking literally when he told his disciples to go and wash uh, others' feet. If he is, we certainly have no indication whatsoever that they ever did it. You, you would think in, you know, in the uh, early part, we see them selling everything and all that and uh, gathering together, uh, breaking house from bre- you know, bread from house to house. Why doesn't it ever speak of them washing feet? Doesn't look like they took that literally, though certainly they took the servant aspect of it literally. Uh, so I don't think it's literal. And I also don't think that this directly applies to those of us in the church today. I think we follow Paul. And, uh, so, you know, if you, if your, uh, if your doctrine is WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, Jesus would take off his garments and put on a towel and wash out his feet. That's what Jesus would do. And that then would be what we should do. I I think, again, there's much more of a spiritual message that is uh, given here. Some of you may know, by the way, that uh, even though I pastor a Baptist church, I do not believe in ordinances. I don't believe that uh, we are ordained, required to do anything. Uh, I think that uh, there are some things that symbolically we might want to do, like an observance of the Last Supper. I don't have a problem with that at all. Uh, and uh, and yet, is that an ordinance? An ordinance is, if you don't do it, you've broken the law. If you don't do it, you get a ticket. If, if you don't do it, you're disobedient. I don't think we have uh, ordinances, uh, though I think the apostles certainly did. Uh, so, uh, here he comes again, and he says, hey, this is uh, what you ought to do. And then verses 16 and 17, I think, uh, give us the understanding that I have taken, and that is that this is a spiritual application. And wouldn't you agree with me? It is, it is beautiful and worthy of imitation 
for anyone of any dispensation, in fact, almost uh, for anyone anywhere, anytime, uh, that there is something beautiful in servant leadership, the one who doesn't come with a haughty spirit, but wa- rather someone who comes and says, hey, uh, I, will, I will be your servant. I'll go last. I'll make the sacrifice. That's always a beautiful thing, and that's where the Lord was. Verses 16 and 17, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent me. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. And so, again, the, uh, the, the moral of the story, so to speak, in verses 16 and 17, and the moral of uh, the story, I think, again, is uh, pretty clear, and that is that uh, Jesus expected his followers to have a, a, a servant kind of leadership, his disciples to have a servant kind of leadership. Now, I, I, uh, as we go through that, I don't think that we have to have a foot washing ceremony. Uh, I don't think that it's directly to us. Does that mean I don't think we should have a servant attitude that rather we should come in and lord it over them as the Gentiles do? No, we want the spirit of our Lord to carry through. And so we do want to ca- to uh, uh, come through in, I think, in a very humble manner in our love, in our convictions. Uh, we don't have to lord it over. We don't have to beat people over the head in order to... Uh, uh, to, to uh, have any strength in carrying out uh, the things uh, of the gospel that we preach. Well, that brings us to the end of 52 sessions of the uh, Gospel of John. So I tell you what, next week, let's have the 53rd. How's that sound? Let's just keep right on going. And next week, uh, we're, we continue in the upper room, as we will for several weeks, because chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 all take place in the upper room. Five of the 22 chapters of the Gospel of John are here in this upper room experience. So we're going to see a lot of the last hours of uh, Jesus uh, in all of this, and I think it'll be a uh, beautiful thing. And uh, with that, I want to Give a a few greetings and say hello to uh, some of you who are here with us tonight. Always a blessing and uh, would love for you if you can stick around uh, to uh, uh, just say hi on uh, uh, YouTube or on Randy White Ministries. We uh, got booted off Facebook. Uh, It's happened several times. You never know what you said. I'd like to know so I could say it again. But I never know exactly what I, because they don't have to tell you anything. So you, you don't just call us a hello, Mr. Zuckerberg. I got uh, kicked off of your platform. What did I say? Uh, you, you don't know. Who knows? Um, I might have said uh, something like, the Bible is true. And I got kicked off for a while. They always let you back on after they give you, you know, uh, 30 days or whatever. Sometimes it's three days. Sometimes it's 10 days. Sometimes it's 30 days. Eventually you get booted off forever and ever. Uh, and they'll, they might boot me because, uh, I, uh, I broadcast more than you do, but trust me, they'll get you too. Give them time. They'll boot you off. YouTube, I've been booted off there, too. Uh, It'll happen again. That's why Nathan has been working feverishly to give us a new broadcast opportunity uh, where we have servers that will broadcast and get it all out. It's amazing, as I've learned all this, how complicated it is to send it up to somewhere. And it's no surprise that these are very big companies that do this because to get it up and then send it out, you know, 100, 200, 300 ways all at the same time all around the world and to make it lickety split so you're not there looking at a dial, that's hard to do. So he's making it all happen and I'm uh, proud of him and I'm uh, uh, be thankful for you if you help pay the bill. Click the donate button every now and then, and uh, that uh, is uh, grateful. And uh, we'll be we'll be up and running uh, before YouTube kicks us off, unless they kick us off tonight. I don't know. Will we be up and running tomorrow? Uh, we're, we're thinking not tomorrow. So it ought to be nice for another twenty four hours.
Uh, it'll come soon. And then we got to put it through some testing and all that kind of stuff. So it'll be in the background just a little bit. But just wanted to let you know what's going on behind the scenes. Jim and Piedmont, welcome. You know, I learned yesterday that Piedmont is named after an area in northwestern Italy. I didn't know this. Piedmont is a, is a region in northwestern Italy. And there is somewhere, I suppose, near Piedmont, a place named Valdez, is it? Valdez, South Carolina? Uh, or is Valdez in North Carolina? Nonetheless, Valdez came from the Valdensians. We normally call them Waldensians. Remember the Waldensians, Peter Waldo and all that, if you remember any of your church history? Uh, and that uh, uh, a long time ago, some distant relatives of them settled there in that area. I didn't know that. I, I picked that up. And I'm curious, and maybe somebody else knows, uh, Valdez is the name of the town, come from Valdensi. I'm wondering if the Spanish name Valdez comes from Waldensian. I, I don't know. I tried to find out. I couldn't really tell. Uh, anybody know? Interesting. Uh, Mike and Lorna, good to see you. Pittston, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, welcome. Bill in Conroe, Texas. Glad you joined us tonight. Uh, Rodney and Denise in Memphis, Tennessee. Good to see you. Vina in Western Australia. Welcome. Uh, what is it? Uh, about to be fall in Western Australia. Um, and uh, Valerie, I've forgotten where you're from, but welcome, Valerie. It's been good to see you uh, the last uh, uh, few uh, weeks here. Uh, Cliff in uh, Ontario, good to see you. Um, hope you are doing well. Debbie and Daryl, uh, right there together in Crystal Springs, Mississippi. I appreciate it. Uh, glad you're here. And... Um, Let's uh, let's see here. Uh, we've got uh, Eric in Ohio. Evening to you from Eric in Ohio. Uh, 26 Vino. Oh, is it Gerald? I get this mixed up. Um, oh, yeah, there it is. Gerald. Thanks. Thanks for helping me out. You all who have these incognito names, it always takes me a while and I have to think, oh, 26 Vino. Glad you're here. Uh, Gerald in the Netherlands. And I've just given up on saying it. I need a recording. I don't know. I don't know how you do that, but if you can record the name of your town and send it to Randy White Ministries, Randy at randywhiteministries.org, you just do that. And maybe I'll just stop and play it every time. Um, Glad you're here from the Netherlands. Roger and Carol from uh, Fresno, California. I can pronounce Fresno. Um, and uh, I need to go to Fresno someday. I don't think I've ever been to Fresno. Unless, does the Amtrak that goes from San Francisco to Reno, Salt Lake, Denver, does it go through Fresno? I don't remember. It goes through Sacramento, I think. Fresno's not there. I don't think I've been to Fresno. Um, and um, good to uh, good to see you anyway. Nancy and Ed up in Pueblo West, Colorado. I've been there several hundred times. <laughs> Glad you're here. Linda in Lexington. Uh, welcome. Been there too. Uh, Mel in the UK. Good to see you. We're getting more and more of a UK audience. Not so much like Mel who joins us at two in the morning, but uh, we got a lot in our Ask the Theologian program more and more. Uh, and always nice to see them. Mel, good to uh, see you. 2 a.m., I think, something like that in the morning. Uh, uh, Shirley out in uh, Ridgecrest, California, always joins us. Uh, I haven't been to Ridgecrest either. One of these days, maybe I'll go out and experience an earthquake. You all are like the earthquake people uh, in Ridgecrest. Can you schedule them? Like, you know, go on a little vac earthquake vacation? I, I prefer it to be scheduled because I don't want to be like in a shanty when it happens. But it would be fun. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas, good to see you here. Uh, are there study notes? I think we had the study notes up, did we not? Uh, 
Yeah, the randywhiteministries.org, I believe they're up now. Um, perhaps weren't when you put the comment on there. Uh, but uh, good to see Bolingbrook, Illinois. Uh, Scarlett in Illinois also. Good to uh, see you and uh, glad you are there. Anywhere near Bolingbrook? Uh, I don't know, uh, but uh, glad you're here. Jeff in Trinidad, Colorado. Been there a lot of times too. Uh, and uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Thank you. The Last Supper painting. I think I said Michelangelo, didn't I? It was Leonardo da Vinci who did The Last Supper. Um, some interesting stories behind that, too. I don't know uh, how much uh, all of uh, that uh, is true. Let's see. I got some chats going on, and I didn't follow through all those uh, chats, so I'll look at those later, see if you said anything important to uh, the rest of you. Uh, and, uh, oh, I got an amen from Chuck. Amen, Chuck, we follow Paul. That's right. Otherwise, we'd be washing feet. I don't know if that'd go over so good in Oklahoma, would it? That's, maybe that's why not many of the brethren churches in Oklahoma. Not sure. <laughs> Helga, uh, in... Um, Norway. Start to say Finland. That's where Genty's from. Helga, Norway, right? I, I, get that, I did get that right. It's Norway, right? Uh, good to see you. Uh, Helga and Daryl and Lisa in Kansas. Uh, well, you've got some brethren in Kansas, I think. Some foot washing people in Kansas, probably, don't you? Uh, incidentally, I think maybe Daryl and Lisa are coming uh, to uh, see me. Would love to see some of the rest of you as well in Jensen, Nebraska. That would be north of Mound Ridge, Kansas. Uh, Jensen, Nebraska, March 19, 20, and 21. That is next, not this, but next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, and I'll have five sessions and we'll be speaking about Calvinism, Calvinism, dispensationalism, put all that together. We'll have a good time uh, in Jensen at the Jensen Bible Church, Jensen, Nebraska. You can uh, send me an email, any of those of you who would like to uh, have some information about that. And uh, uh, if you live within, uh, I've been saying 2,000 miles, maybe we should go 3,000. you got a week to plan it. Uh, Jerry in Georgia, good to see you, Leesburg, Georgia. Uh, glad to uh, see you here. Uh, glad to be free from Facebook. Yeah, I am so close there. Every time I get on Facebook, I get frustrated because I see, you know, somebody commented on something and it's uh, fact checked and I just, you know, grumble and get mad and wonder why I'm there. And then I go back. Uh, pray for me. I got to I got to get uh, get out of that. Uh, the Quad Father, good to see you again. Arlington, uh, Texas, the one and only Quad Father from uh, Arlington. I'm always uh, good to see you. Thank you. And I uh, hadn't seen your name on there uh, uh, a little bit, but uh, glad you're here. Um, and uh, it is Norway. Good. I got Norway right. Thanks, Helga. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, I need to, you know, I need to do a tour sometime. We need to do this in person. Uh, we'll broadcast from uh, England, from Norway, from the Netherlands, from Belgium, all these uh, places where we've got listeners. Uh, you know, it'd just be a fun week, wouldn't it? Um, we'll work on it a little bit. Um, and um, uh, let's, let's see here if I've got any new questions uh, tonight. Uh, uh, Cliff in Ontario says, I hope Jensen, Nebraska will be recorded. Please, Nathan, <laughs> please. You know, maybe I shouldn't confess this. I tried to get the whole family to go with me. I was like, come on, Nathan, Whitney, Hallie, Shelley, Kay, let's all get in the car and make a road trip to Jensen, Nebraska. It's like, 15, 13 hours, I think. I would be so much fun. I could talk to them about theology all day long and have such a great time. And they said, why don't you get a flight? Get, just get a flight. Well, we need to take care of the dogs. And they're not going to Jensen, Nebraska with me. I'm just thoroughly disappointed. But maybe Nathan can set up a way that we can get it recorded. Let's uh, 
Let's work on that. Thanks. I appreciate it, Cliff. Uh, in uh, Ontario. And I appreciate each one of you being here tomorrow morning. Uh, uh, if we don't get kicked off Facebook, we'll be online. And uh, excuse me, off, uh, if we don't get kicked off YouTube, we'll be online at randywhiteministries.org and look forward to seeing you there. And uh, we will uh, have 10 a.m. our Ask the Theologian program. And then at uh, 7 p.m. tomorrow night, we will have... Uh, Ezekiel, in the, the 40th chapter of Ezekiel. Looking forward to that. Hope you'll join us uh, for that. Friday also, Ask the Theologian. Sunday, regular uh, schedule. Hey, next Wednesday, uh, those of you who may happen to be local, uh, you've noticed that uh, here during uh, the winter time we have been in studio. Next Wednesday, back in the auditorium at the pulpit, uh, carrying on our John study. And uh, so back into some uh, local fellowship here, you all could join us. We would love to have you. We'll have a little uh, meal before the service. I think because it's St. Patrick's Day, we're having corned beef. So come join us for some corned beef and, uh, and the Gospel of John. We'll have some fun with it. With that, let me have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for these who join us in fellowship. Uh, it is a joy always to see these same names and chats uh, going through and to build a fellowship, even though across the miles. And we're grateful that our fellowship is centered on the word of God. And we study to show ourselves approved, workmen who have no need to be ashamed. That takes a lot of study, dear Heavenly Father. Uh, learning to rightly divide and where to rightly divide. And we do it humbly, dear Heavenly Father, even as we've been given this uh, illustration of our Savior, who uh, was such a, a an humble servant. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we would be uh, wise as serpents and gentle as doves, that we would know in our world how to serve in uh, such a way that serves to spread the gospel and the fame of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done and what he is going to do. And we pray that when our attitude is not becoming of the one we serve, that uh, that uh, attitude would uh, quickly change on our account. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. We'll see you tomorrow morning or soon when we can join again. And uh, it'll be a blessing. We'll see you soon. Thank you.